part A is just asking us to find h prime of two. And we know that this line is tangent to h at x equals two. So the derivative of h at two should have um, a slope that is equal to the slope of the tangent line. And the slope of this tangent line is two thirds. So h prime of two ought to just be two thirds. And that was worth one point. Everybody good there with part A? Sorry about that. All right, part B. Um, part B says we got a new function A and it's a of x is 3x cubed h of x. First write an expression for a prime uh, and then find a prime of two. So an expression for a prime just comes from taking the derivative of this. Which ought to just be done using the product rule. So 3x cubed h prime of x plus 9x squared h of x. And then to find a prime of two, it ought to be three times two cubed times h prime of two. And we know that h prime of two is two thirds because we found that in part A. And then nine times two squared times h of two. And h of two we know from the given information at the beginning is four. So we end up with threes cancel there. We got two cubed, which is eight times two is 16. And then plus this, which is what? Uh, and what is that? Four times four is 16 times nine is 144. So it looks like we get 160. <clears throat> and that was worth three points. Um, one, uh, two points for correctly getting your product rule um, done properly, and then one point for the answer. Any questions there on that? All right. Part C says that h of x is x squared minus 4 over 1 minus f of x cubed um, when x does not equal 2. And we know that the limit as x approaches 2 of a of x, or of h of x, sorry, can be evaluated using L'Hopital's rule. Um, so we want to use that information and this limit to find f of 2 and f prime of 2. <clears throat> uh, so to find f of two, well, if we're looking, first off, if we're looking for the limit as x approaches two of h of x, that'd mean we need to plug in two. So that'd be two squared is four minus four is zero over, this needs to be zero if we can evaluate it using L'Hopital's rule, right? If the numerator is zero, the denominator has to be zero for L'Hopital's rule, which means that this denominator here, we should set equal to zero. And instead of writing f of x, I'm going to write f of 2 because we're evaluating that denominator at 2. And so that needs to be equal to 0. And if you add the f of 2 cubed over and take the cube root, you just get f of 2 is equal to 1. Everybody good with the first part of c there? Yeah. All right. And the second part of c wants us to find f prime of 2. And so we know that since this function, um, since h is differentiable, um, and we know that it's, that means it must be continuous, and that means that we know that this value needs to equal 4 here, which means, which means the limit needs to equal 4. Um, you know, if a twice differential function, the function is continuous and differentiable, so it must equal 4 at this limit. Um, and so we'll use L'Hopital's rule 
and take the derivative of the top, which is 2x, and the derivative of the bottom, so the derivative of the 1 is 0, and the derivative of negative f of x cubed, we're taking the derivative of negative f of x cubed, well, the constant stays, this becomes 3f of x squared times the derivative of f of x. And we know that this, when you evaluate it at x equals 2, needs to equal 4, because that's what it said at the original start of the problem. So we'll evaluate um, all of this when x is 2. So that tells us that we have 4 over negative 3 times f of 2 squared, and f of 2 we already found was 1. And then f, uh, or f prime of 2 is what we're looking for. We want that to equal 4. Well, that means that this denominator needs to equal 1. And that means that f prime of 2 then needs to equal negative 1 third. Good or no? Any questions on that? Great. So um, even though the h of x function looks discontinuous, it is continuous because they told you it was and it gave you a value at 2, right? Uh, yeah, there's a, a little bit of an issue with what they've sort of set up here. Right. If we know that it's twice differentiable, that means that it and normally we say that means it's differentiable everywhere but then down here they're sort of saying that it's not uh, it's, it's it's not it's not wrong what they're saying because this is not necessarily what h of x always equals h of x could equal something else at two that just plugs in the gap right so i mean it makes sense but it's just it's it's sort of a contrived situation that they've made up that it's not likely to ever happen in real life with a real function that i gave you but yeah, does that answer your question or no? Yep, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions with part C before we briefly talk about part D? Um, this was actually worth four points total. Um, it was one point for getting this set up to equal zero here, one point for this, one point for setting this whole L'Hopital's rule part of it equal to four and one point for getting the answer. Okay, so for part D, it then says it's known that G of X is less than or equal to H of X for X between one and three. And they're giving us a, you know, a third new function, K. Um, and K of X is Oh, well, look, it's sandwiched or squeezed between G and H on the interval 1 to 3. We want to know, is K continuous at X equals 2? And the answer should be yes, um, but our reasoning here needs to involve the sandwich theorem in some way while also saying that um, we need to say, first off, that G and H are continuous. Continuous. There we go. And G and H are continuous. We know that because they're differentiable. And if they're continuous, um, that means that when we try to sandwich K of X in between them, I think H of X was the larger one and G of X was the smaller one. Right. Um, and we know that G of 2 equals 4, which is also h of 2 equals 4. Well, that means that k sandwiched between them, k of 2 must therefore also equal 4. Um, and I mean, the only place where we might have something weird happening is at this value of 2, where we thought we might have had like discontinuities before from from up here, but we, we know that it's not. Um, and so therefore it's continuous. G and H are both continuous. K is sandwiched between the two of them, which tells us that K of two must equal four and tells us that it must be continuous at X equals two. Okay. 
that makes sense or not. Wait, could you repeat that last part? Like, how do you know if the limit of k is also um, approaching 4? How do I know? Sorry, say, say the second part of that. How do I know what? How do you, like, I know um, why k of 2 is equal to 4, but how do you know it's continuous? Oh, well, I mean, the, so we know that k of 2 is equal to 4, but the squeeze theorem or the sandwich theorem says that if the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x is equal to the limit as x approaches 2 of h of x, this is like, this is your sandwich theorem right here. If this is true, um, which equals 4, we said, right, then the limit as x approaches 2 of k of x also has to be 4. I mean, that's the sandwich theorem right there. So we're saying that the limits of all three of them must be four, and the value of k must be four there. Um, and so if the limit as we approach two is four and the value at two is four, then it's got to be continuous at x equals two. OK, that makes sense. Thanks. Um, yeah, no problem. And uh, Claire, so you say we don't have to write out sandwich theorem? Yeah. You don't have to. They did, but if you wrote it out without specifically referencing that, in this case, it's fine. Sometimes they will say they'll like specify a theorem, you know, and then you gotta say squeeze theorem, sandwich theorem, or if it's something else, intermediate value theorem, or mean value theorem, or whatever, whatever theorem you might have. But. Anybody else, any questions there on that first one? Oh, and that last part was over just one point. All right. So let's move forward and do this one. This is a not too difficult of a, of a problem to complete, but it's a, yeah, it's a good type to see it. Yeah, if they don't put one of these in the free response, there is usually a question or two with a chart where you got to do something similar to what A and B are asking you to do or even C is doing. I think this would be a good one for us to look at. I'm going to give you guys 15 minutes to work through this one, then we'll go through it, and then we'll probably be finished for the day. So um, we're given a table of values for f, f prime, g, and g prime at four different values of x. Um, and First thing it wants us to do is take a look at a function k, which is f of g of x, and write the tangent line equation for k at x equals 3. So in order to write a tangent line equation, we need two things. We need a point, so we need to find what k of 3 is, which ought to just be f of g of 3. And if we're going to plug in 3 to this, that's f of g of 3. And g of 3 is 6. So that just becomes f of 6, and f of 6 is 4. So the point is 3, comma 4. And then we want to look for k prime to find the slope. Well, the derivative of k, we'd have to use the chain rule for because this is a composition of two functions. So it's the outer function, f prime evaluated at the inner, times the derivative of the inner function. So f prime of g times g prime. That's just your regular old chain rule. So k prime of 3 ought to be f prime of g of 3 times g prime of 3. And then, as we said before, g of 3 was 6, right? So this is f prime of 6. And g prime of 3 is 2. So we have 2 times f prime of 6, and that's 5. So we got 5 times 2, or a slope of 10. So y minus 4 equals 10 times x minus 3. Any questions there on that one? Everyone's good with part A. That was worth three points. So two points 
for finding the slope and one point for writing the equation. All right, part B wants us to find h prime of one. And so we're given h of x, which is g of x over f of x. So um, first off, h prime of x, the derivative of that should just be done using the quotient rule. So denominator times the derivative of the numerator minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator, all divided by the denominator squared. And if we're looking for that at x equals one, it just becomes f of one g prime of one minus g of one f prime of one over f of one squared. And so we just need to figure out what all those values are. f of one was negative six. So we got negative six and in the denominator we're gonna have negative six squared. Uh, we got g prime of one, which is eight minus, then we got g of one, which was two and f prime of one, which was three. Everybody good there? Okay, all right. And this is negative 48 minus six or negative 54 over 36, 18 goes into both of those making that negative three halves. And you had two points if you got an expression for h prime of one and one point for simplifying it down to negative three halves properly. Any questions there? If we wrote the derivative, but we didn't do the expression for one, do we still get the points? Um, did you write like this at least? Yeah, like I skipped the steps you wrote the points by, but like just plug them in. Yeah, I mean, I. I think so. I don't know. It's it's sometimes it's hard to say. I would say yes. Somebody as long as you like show that you plugged the points in properly, it's probably fine. I mean, it, the the scoring guide specifically says expression for h prime of one, but like this is an expression for h prime of one, right? I mean, it's just already plugged in, and it doesn't explicitly say find h prime of x and like plug in one to it and show that. So I think you're probably good. Okay. Yeah. Um, one thing I want to mention about this is when, when, you know, they publish their scoring guidelines, they publish what they think is most likely for a student to do. And there are other options oftentimes. So sometimes we go through other ways to do some of the problems. And sometimes there's like, you know, you might leave off one little thing. And when when the people are in the room grading the AP test, they're given a little bit of leeway on like, you know, it's, you know, it's a little bit, you know, it's a little subjective. You can, they can sort of make a decision about what you're saying. And then um, based on what the scoring guidelines that they give them say, and based on, you know, like seven other things that they might write and give to them, but they don't share with the regular AP teachers like me. Um, so it's probably fine. It probably says in there like, oh, if they didn't write this, but they had this, it's fine. That's a long-winded explanation more than you probably wanted to hear, but that's, yeah, that's what I got. Everybody good there? <laughs> Okay, so for part C, I believe it was asking us for the integral from one to three of f double prime of two x. Is that right? Yep. Okay, so in order to integrate, let's say just f double prime of x, that would just be f prime of x. But the two x in there makes this a function composed within another function. So we have to do a u substitution on this. And if you can do the u substitution in your head and get that integral spectacular, um, 
why am I writing this all out already? Um, but if you can't, that's okay. We're going to make the substitution that u is 2x and du is 2dx. And if I need a 2dx in there, I'll, I'll just put a 2 in there and a 1 half outside. So we end up with 1 half of an integral from 2 to 6 of f double prime of u du. And so when we integrate that, we get 1 half of f prime of u from 2 to 6. And if you want to go back into terms of x and replace the u with a 2x, then just please don't forget that you need to go back and change the 2 and the 6 to a 1 and a 3. Okay. Um, but you don't need to do that. We've just got 1 half of f prime of 6 minus f prime of 2. And you'll note that if you'd gone back and written this as f prime of 2x and changed this to a 1 and 3, well, f prime of 2 times 3 would be f prime of 6, and f prime of 2 times 1 would be f prime of 2. So it would be the exact same thing. Anyway, we get 1 half of f prime of 6 minus f prime of 2. Looking back, f prime of 6 was 5, and f prime of 2 was negative 2. So this is 5 minus negative 2 for our final answer of 7 halves. And that was also worth 3 points. Two for correctly anti-differentiating, one for the correct numeric answer. Any questions on that? Everybody good there? No questions? <laughs>